right, thank you, thank you, thank you, Brother Ethan. I was a little bit concerned, though, when he was playing that trumpet. I thought, man, I think if he passed away, the Lord would use him to blow the trumpet for the rapture. <laughs> I'm not wishing that on you. Anyway, make sure you stop by the table in the narthex and pick up a prayer card. And then I started to mention something um, about the kangaroos and the emus that we have out there. And so I thought I'd bring this plaque in because this is very, very interesting. Now, one of the things that we try to do out there in Dolby is do a lot of object lessons. And uh, every Sunday morning, I try to do one. It takes about three, four minutes long. And then we send that out, post that on Facebook. And every week, 3,000, 3,500 people actually watch that. So that's interesting. So here's my object lesson this morning, okay? So... We have two animals, large animals, there in Africa that are wild. We have the kangaroo and we have the emu, and we've seen them in the wild. We have more kangaroos than we do emus, but this is the Australia crest. And so on the official documents and things like this, they have this Australia crest. And for a while, I wondered, oh, why in the world would they have a kangaroo and an emu on their official crest? I mean, couldn't you pick out a better animal, you know? But this is why I think that years ago they were chosen. Not only are they large, not only are they African animals, but does anyone know what these two animals cannot do? They cannot walk backwards. It's good for a church. It's good for an individual. It's good for a believer. If you have to look down and see which way your feet are pointed, look down and see which way your feet are pointed. God has designed us to go forward, not to go backwards. That's a roost skin out there. I was going to preach a message on how, <laughs> how, an, how an Australian missionary is like a kangaroo. I've got 10 points. I'm not going to preach that this morning. I never preached it. I'm going to preach it tonight maybe. But this morning, I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to turn to a curious verse of Scripture. Go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 25. Proverbs 25, just for part of one verse, and then, Lord willing, <laughs> oh, how many, how many of you, this is the first time you've ever seen me or met me? Is there anybody in here who's never met me before? Anybody's there? Okay, all right, all right, all right, get ready, all right? So the rest of you know me, all right, you know, uh, I, uh, I, I like to have a, I love the Lord, man, God's good to me, and uh, we try to have a, just walk with him. Man, God's good. But you, but you may be wishing you hadn't met me because I'm going to preach a message this morning, Lord willing. It is the shortest message title I've ever had, but it is the, the most points I've ever had in a message, except for one other message. Now, it's not as long as when I preached at Lehigh Valley. Several years ago, I was asked to speak on a, sun, on a Wednesday night, and I preached. Do you remember this, Rachel? I preached 40 reasons on why God loves me. I have 40 points. This morning, I don't have that many. Almost, but not that many. <laughs> if you have the pen of a ready scribe, you're going to want to take some quick notes this morning. We're going to try to give you 17 reasons that answer the question, why? Why? Now, that's a question that a lot of us ask a lot of times. Why? And sometimes we ask it in a wrong way. Why did this happen to me, Lord? And sometimes we ask it like Jesus did on the cross. Why hast thou forsaken me? And sometimes we want an answer to the question, why? Did you ever stop and think about why missions? One of the things that I struggled with in surrendering to go to Africa is, God, why would you take... Next to Lehigh Valley, I believe this is my favorite church in the country, and I mean that. And I thought, Lord, why would you take me away from a good, good preacher like Pastor Doug? And I mean, I'm, I, I'm here, I've got nine kids. Why, why, why would you call me to Africa? Why would you do that? I want to talk this morning about why, and I believe God gives us at least 17 reasons why missions and why God does what he does. But look at Proverbs chapter 25, and look at this in verse number 2, where the Bible says, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. God doesn't always answer the question, why? And it's his glory not to. Why did this happen? Why did I grow up on a farm? 
Well, when we worked in Africa, we were working in rural areas, and now we're working in Australia in rural areas, and okay, God, now I know why I grew up on a farm. Sometimes God doesn't tell us why things happen, and sometimes he does, and it's for his glory either way. So I want us to look this morning here at why. Why missions? Why would God call a chap with, and I'm sorry, I use that term a lot, this Aussie term, a chap. Why would God call a man to leave family, leave home, leave his church, go to a foreign land, learn a foreign language, a foreign culture, uh, foreign ways, so far away, leave, and then, you know, send his kids back and eventually grandkids. Why would God do that? Is God just? Is God right? Well, God is to be glorified whether we know or not, but I want to show you this morning why, I think, 17 reasons why God does this, why he does that. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the time this morning, the place to meet, the people that have met, and an open Bible. Almost everybody, maybe everybody, has an open Bible on their lap for them to see this is your word. Lord, we've got a lot of verses, too many verses to look up. But we thank you for your word. And we ask you, Lord, use the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts as we answer this question, why? In Jesus' name, amen. So the first reason I want you to, to understand is that man is lost. Man is lost. That's why missions, man is in darkness, man is in sin, man is wandering around. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 18, verse number 11, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. If you're not saved this morning, if you haven't been rescued, then you're, you're spiritually, you're meandering. You're wandering. You're trying to figure things out. Jesus came for the lost. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. One of the reasons for missions is because many there be that go in to the wide gate, the broad way. Few there be that find the narrow way and the straight gate. So man is lost. That's the first reason why we have missions. That's the first why, reason why God says, okay, missionary, I want you to go there because man is lost. Second reason. Sin brings lamentation, sorrow. Sin brings lamentation. Proverbs 13, 15 says, but the way of transgressors is hard. Isaiah 57, 20 says, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Hebrews eleven twenty five reads that the pleasures of sin are but for a season. We're saying sin brings lamentations. That's why missions, sin brings lamentation. Romans 2, 9, tribulation and anguish is upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Romans 3.16, destruction and misery are in their ways. James 5.1, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Sin brings lamentation. Thirdly, the demands of the law. The demands of the law, pastor mentioned that, that if you are not saved, you are facing the judgment of God. One of those pictures that I show of Hebrews 9.27 has a Stick picture of God, as it were, and man who was bowing before God. And I go through about four or five verses there, and I ask them the question, how do you think you will do on Judgment Day? And then I launch out into the Ten Commandments and the, the good person test, we call it, and ask them things like that, be able to witness them. See, the Bible says that in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 3 tells us what sin is. Sin, whosoever committeth sin, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Romans 4, 15 says, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. In 1 Timothy 1, 9 we read, knowing this, that the law is not made for righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers. See, the demands of the law say you are guilty. So why missions? Why does God take a man and send him so far? So far because not only is man lost, not only is sin, uh, not only does bring lamentation, but the law says you are guilty. You are guilty. Number four, because of that, if a person is not saved, does not get saved, and if you're here this morning and you're not saved, the fourth point, hell is loathsome. Hell is not a happy place. Hell is not a pretty place. 
Hell is not a place you want to go. Hell is not a place where you think you're going to... You may go there with your friends, but you will not have friends in hell. You will not be drinking it up. You'll not be laughing it up. You'll not think that, oh, there's a little bit of fire over there or there. The Bible talks about a lake of fire. Jesus, did you know, spoke more on hell than he did on heaven. You may think there's no hell. The cults may, cults may say there's no hell, but Jesus said there is a hell. There is a hell to be shunned. There is a heaven to be gained. Hell is loathsome. In Luke chapter 16, the Bible says about this rich man, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Revelation 14, 11 says, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Now, I believe that we aren't far from the rapture and the uh, hence coming tribulation. But the tribulation is going to be a cakewalk compared to what hell is. In Revelation 16.10, people in the tribulation will gnaw their tongues for pain. They will blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. Why does the man get called to missions? Why does God send missionaries? Because hell is a loathsome place. God does not want want men to go there. I was trying to talk to a man. I mentioned that I volunteered at the museum and there was a man at the museum, had been there for some years. His name was Greg. And Greg was a hard guy. Greg was a tough guy. And Greg just wanted to argue. Whenever I brought up the subject of the Bible, he just wanted to bring up, he wanted to argue. And I didn't want to, during tea time, actually get in an interaction with him. So, but one time I gave him one of those Bushman guides, a little booklet that I showed on the picture up there. That is the only thing he ever took. He stuck it in his pocket. I hope that he read it. He had cancer when we got there six years ago, and he would get better and then worse and better. And finally I was told, Greg's in the hospital. He's probably not going to go home. So I went to the hospital, and I found him just before the doctor came in to check him out. He said, Jerry, I'm okay. Jerry, my religion is 40,000 years older than your religion. I'm not afraid. I've lived a good life. I've lived a happy life. I'm, I'm not afraid to face death. And, a couple, and they sent him home, and he died at home. So they said, um, Jerry, they want you to have a little prayer at his funeral, which we had in the hall there at the museum. And so that Saturday, I went up there, prepared to say a few things in case they would ask me. And sure enough, they asked me to say a few things and then have a word of prayer. And so I did. And I took those Bushman guides. I took a stack of Bushman. Bushman guides up there, and there were about 20 chaps there. And I had a little sticker on it that said, In memory of Greg. And I had his, his date there that he had died. So, a testimony was given, though, at that funeral after I spoke. And it was from a lady who owned the house where Greg lived. She had come up from South Australia and um, was... was tending Greg from another house or something. Anyway, she gets a call in the middle of the night. It's 11 o'clock at night. They figured that Greg died four hours later. And she said this. She said, Greg called me up about 11 o'clock at night, woke me up, and he said, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Two weeks before, Jerry, I'm okay. I'm not afraid. It's no problem. You may be sitting here this morning and say, I'm not afraid. It's no problem. And four hours before you die, I guarantee you'll be shaking in your boots. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Take care of that now. The reason why God sends missions is because hell is not a place you want to go. Hell is a loathsome place. Number five, eternity is long. Eternity is long. In Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Mark 9, 44, where their worm, speaking about a person who dies, their worm dies not. They have some sort of a body that the worm just eats on forever. Their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You know what it says two verses later? Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You know what it says two verses later? Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And who do you think said that? Jesus said that. Can you grasp the concept of time? Can you grasp the concept of eternity? See, the worst thing about hell is not the fire. It's probably the fact that I'm going to be here forever and ever and ever. And you don't have to. Because, oh, well, a loving God would not send people to an eternal hell. No, a loving God would put a preacher right in your face and say, you don't have to go there. That's a loving God. So God sends a missionary 
into the four reaches, the far corners of the earth, because eternity is long. The sixth reason why a missionary is sent is because Satan is a liar. Satan is a liar. Oh, my religion's 40,000 years older than yours. I'm not afraid. You don't have to be afraid, not fear. There's no hell. Satan is a liar. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. In Genesis chapter 3 and before and after. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. I, I think of Brother Albert who, who told me, I, I went to a school there in South Africa after classes and started teaching the Bible, and most of the boys were out playing soccer, and there were probably, I don't know, 40 kids left in there because they wanted the Bible study, and maybe five of them were boys and 35 were girls, and one of those boys was Albert. And that was back in like 2002. All right, 22 years later, Albert's married in the ministry, but he said to me one time, he says, Oh, Maruti, I don't know where I'd be or what I'd be doing if you hadn't come to this area to preach the gospel. I thank God for that. That's why God sends missionaries, because Satan is a liar. Religions around the world have their lies, their false truths, and things like that. I was telling Brother Norberg, I'm not part of the ministerium there in Dalby. Now, Dalby has a lot of churches, and the uh, J-Dubs are there, and the Mormons are there, and the Seventh-day Adventists are there, and the Prezies, and the United Church, and Catholic, and Lutheran, and they're all part of the, the um, ministerium, but I'm not. And I was told by a couple of guys, oh, you need to be a part of that, you need to be a part of that. Well, I'm not going to be a part of that, because there's so much lying and lies and false religion and blah, blah, blah that goes on with that. I don't want to be part of that. I'm there to give them the truth because Satan is busy giving them lies. Now, where we live is called the Bible Belt. And I had a man tell me one time, Brother Jerry, starting a church in Dolby's like trying to push water up a hill with a rake. It's tough. But I believe we're there to give people the truth. Satan is a liar. Missionaries are sent to give truth. Number seven, why does God send missionaries? Religion has leaven. Religion has leaven. It might look like it's good and all oh, they talk about Jesus, but it's a little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. And it's no marvel. Satan himself is transformed in an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing of his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, I have a problem when a Baptist union pastor in an Australian town has a community-wide communion service for anybody and everybody to come. I think you would have a problem with that too. So people just move around depending, oh, I like that. I, I think I'll go over there and get a message from that. Oh, I, I think I'll go over there and I think I'll go over there and blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of leaven out there. And it doesn't take a lot of leaven to leaven the lump. Galatians 1, 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. Titus 1, 10, 11 says, for there are many. There's some and there's many, many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Eighth reason, why missions? The world is large. The world is large. There's eight plus billion people and I got to wondering, how many people are born and die every day? So I asked my wife um, to Google that. And it says approximately 150,000 people die every day around the world. I said, okay, now Google how many people are born every day. So she Googles that. 357,000 people are born every day. You add that up, that's a lot of people. Missionaries are sent to various parts of the world, and one of the reasons why I knew the Lord was calling us to Eastern Australia was because, I, I, I don't know, maybe you don't believe this, but I, I believe this, so I'm just going to tell you what I believe the Bible says. I believe that the Great Commission was given to a local church, and I believe the local church ought to try to reach the world. And 
act like and live like and give like and go like, we got to reach this world. So when I knew the Lord was calling us to Australia, I, we supported a couple of missionaries. I think I saw Brother Shrope's picture out there. Is that right? You support Brother Shrope? He's the only missionary shorter than me. I hope you notice that. I felt like a giant around that guy. I met him in January. And he says, Brother Will Hyde, I remember when you came to my church, Brian Baptist Church in Springfield. And he says, I remember what you said. Your name is Will Hyde. You have a lot of will and not much height. I'm glad I made an impression on that. 20 years later, he remembered something like that. Didn't remember the message I preached. Didn't talk about character. Didn't talk about good family or anything. Was, you said that. So, let me backtrack now. I was talking about Brother Shope. <laughs> Shouldn't do that. So, I knew that the Lord, you know, I knew Brother Shrope was there. Our church was supporting Brother Mike Meredith. Anybody know him? I hope you don't. Anyway, he's a dear brother. Um, and there's another uh, brother, Carr, is over there in Western Australia. But we didn't support, Lehigh Valley didn't support anybody in Eastern Australia. So I thought, well, if Lehigh Valley's, and Mark 16, 15. Oh, my, you should read my testimony. My testimony is 37 pages long. It's over 500 verses that God used to get me from point A to point B. And the last verse I read was Mark 16, 15, that impressed upon me, go you into all the world. And I thought, if that's given to a local church, Lehigh Valley needs a presence in, in Eastern Australia. And so I knew it was Eastern Australia. I didn't know where in Eastern Australia. And I showed you this morning how God brought us to Eastern Australia and brought us to that town and brought us to those people. And I just know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God wants us right there for this time. Why? Because that's part of the world and God cares about the world and God wants to reach the world. And God wants to send missionaries. God has sent missionaries. That's why. Because... The world is large, so missionaries have to go around the world. Number nine, a ninth reason is the time is late. The time is late. Romans 13, 11, 12, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Now, I know some people say this. They say, well, see, if the scripture was inspired, then Paul would have known that the Lord was not coming for some time. But he says the time is short. Do you know why that's inspired? Do you know why God told me that? Because God wants us to know that Paul was looking for the return of the Lord in his day. And God wants us to think that the, we should look for the... I rem oh, I remember one time when I was just a boy and I came out to the kitchen. I couldn't have been seven or eight years of age. My mom had the radio on top of the refrigerator. She had it on. I don't know what program it was, Heaven and Home Hour or something, some radio program from 50, 60 years ago. And she's listening to that. And she, she turned and she looked at me and she said, Jerry, the Lord has to be coming back. He has to be coming back soon. He has to be. You know what? He's 50 years closer, 60 years closer than he was. And so the time is late, and we've got to live like that. And by the way, if Paul, if Paul, now Paul tells us to follow him as he followed Christ, so Paul is some sort of an example for us to follow, and if Paul thought the Lord was coming soon, then we need to say, oh, we got plenty of time. You know what we'll do? We'll just let the little kids, we'll let them grow up, and they'll be the missionaries, and we'll send them. No, the time is late. We better understand that. You know what? You might not have next Saturday to go witnessing. You might better do something earlier than that. By the way, on the back of our prayer card, if you want to pick up two prayer cards, you can, because here's what we did. We have that QR code. If you give that to a friend and say, hey, you know, we had a, we had a guest speaker to Australia in our church this morning, and uh, here's this picture of his wife. I want you to have that, and why don't you just take time to scan that QR code. You know what? It takes them to our church website in Emmaus, and it presents the gospel. So I've handed this out at restaurants and fuel stations. I said, hey, here's who my wife and I are. We're just traveling through from Australia. Here's who we are. I said, if you know the Lord, pray for us. If you don't know the Lord, scan that QR code. Why? Because the time's late. The time is short. That's why God sends missionaries now. Number 10, a 10th reason why missions. Missionaries are lacking. Missionaries are lacking. Matthew 9, 37, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. You remember that parable that Jesus told about the guy who went out in his vineyard and he hired people at this hour and this hour and this hour? 
And then at the 11th hour, he went out and he found people standing idle and he hired them. And he said, go work in my vineyard. Remember that story? Matthew chapter 20. You know what we need? If we are in the 11th hour, we need 11th hour workers. Just like Jesus needed 11 hour workers. Just like that mean man needed 11th hour workers. We need people working in this last day. Missionaries are lacking. Number 11. 11th reason for missions. You taking notes? All right, here it is. Evangelizing is labor. Evangelizing is labor. It's work. But I think labor and work is good for us. I believe that God assigned Adam a responsibility before sin ever came into this world. Now, labor is more difficult, but labor is good for us. And it is a task. I mean, Lamentations 3.27 says it's good for man to bear the yoke in his youth. And it's a task where we get to work with the Lord. Um, I know that, you know, when we do things, we have the Lord with us always. But specifically, the scriptures say in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For, I missed the next verse, it's the next verse too. He says, oh no, verse 29, learn of me. We yoke up to Christ. I mean, this, this, this business of missions is where we directly get to be involved with, with God. In 1 Corinthians 3, 9, Paul said, we are labors together with God. In 2 Corinthians 6, 1, we then as workers together with him. Beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. You saw some of the pictures. These people, it's obvious that God's hand is in that. God. And this is the thing that puzzles me. I guess it really shouldn't because Satan is blinded the minds of those who believe not, lest the light of glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. So it shouldn't surprise me because they're blinded. But you ever notice how, oh, I see what God's doing. And so you see how God has put you in the life of a lost person. Maybe somebody, you know, migrates in here from someplace and he's working right next to you and you say, God brought this guy here. I was just praying this morning for somebody to witness to, and this guy just got hired onto the job, and he's working right next to me. Man, and you see that. He doesn't see that. And you witness him, and he doesn't realize that. But you see that God has been working in this person's life. God is working in my life. I believe that God's working in everybody's life in some way or shape or form. Sometimes he shows us, sometimes he doesn't. Like some of these things, like all these people we know. And, man. I mean, we were asked this question. I don't know how many times we've been asked this question. Why Dolby? It's a good question. Thank you for asking me. So I wrote a track. Why Dolby? From America through Africa to Australia. And I give my testimony. And I talk about God called us right here. My neighbor, his name is Lindsay. My neighbor, Lindsay. That house that I showed you. Well, the first day we were there, I was outside looking at something. And I sensed that somebody was behind me. And I turned around and here was my neighbor, Lindsay. And I gave him the gospel right that day. But over the course of the next four years, I talked to him, talked to him, talked to him. And a couple years ago, he came to me and he said, or maybe about a year ago, and he said, when I die, I want you to have my funeral. I said, what do you want me to say? He says, oh, I'll write it down for you. I said, no, no, no. I said, do you want me to tell people that you're in heaven or you're in hell? What do you want me to tell them? I knew him by that time pretty well. Time got closer and closer for him and finally in December, end of December, he stopped taking dialysis treatments and they gave him eight to ten days to pass away and he went to the hospital. We had guests that were there and so I got up there one Monday morning about 8.30 and I present the gospel to him again to, to share with him, you know, about, about how, I mean, he's going to face death. And at that point, he said, yes, I'm ready. He nodded that he was ready to, to pray and, and accept the Lord as Savior. Now, whether he did or not, you know, I, I do not know. But, you know, I said to him at one point, I said, Lindsay, do you understand that God took me from Iowa to Pennsylvania to South Africa to Australia to Dalby to that house on Burke Street to this house, right? And you, do you think that God would put a Baptist preacher right in your path like that? Don't you think God loves you? I see that. So we see that. That's work. That's labor. But see, God's, see, God has his part. I have my part. Did you ever notice this? That when it talks about the wide gate and the narrow gate and the wide road and narrow gate, did you ever notice this? It says, few there be that find it. Few there be that find it. Now, God has his responsibility. I have no question that he's going to do that. 
We have our responsibility. Sometimes there's question about whether we're going to do that. But the lost person has some sort of responsibility. Few there be that find it. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. If you're here this morning and you're lost, don't you blame another person for not witnessing enough. Don't you blame God for not... You need to seek the Lord. You need to see this is a serious business. I'm facing eternity. And you can put it off. Lindsay told me that first day that I met him, he said, oh, he said, we got married in the Prezi Church and I haven't been in church in 50 years. But he would never commit to a Bible study. Never came. I hope he got saved on that day. I don't know. I just know there's no reason why a person needs to wait until they're four hours before death. Because you never know. You might have an accident and go out into eternity. You may not have four hours. This may be your last opportunity. So, so missions, God does this because God works together with us in mission, missions, um, evangelizing his labor. Number 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to read the verse and I'm going to tell you what the point is. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, not many, many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You say, what are you saying? Well, here's what I think it says. God often uses the littlest and the least when it comes to missions. So it's not somebody that, you know, is, is one that, you know, makes a lot of book recommendations. It's usually not people that go into missions that, you know, are high and mighty in society and have all the money and, you know, own the, the universities and things like that. It's not often, doesn't say always, it's not often that God uses those kind of people. I remember many, many years ago and there was a man on our in our church, and, and he had, <laughs> Rachel, you're going to like this. I want, you, I want you to send this to your dad after I say this, okay? Because there was a man in our church that thought God was calling him into missions. And this is years ago before I ever went into missions and before your dad ever went into missions. And he says, well, you know, he, maybe God's calling him. Because, you know, sometimes God calls people that are a little bit odd into missions. <laughs> And I agreed with him. Now both her dad and I are in the mission field. We're a little bit odd. But, but God is pleased to do that. So my point is, you might be sitting here and say, oh, well, I don't have many skills. I don't have any talents, ability, blah, blah, blah. And you're probably just the person God wants to use. And so that's why God does that, because an opportunity for him to say, I'm going to take that Tom, Dick, and Harry over there, and I'm going to take him over to this place in a remote place, blah, 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 and I'm going to use him for my glory. That's the way God works. So... God often uses the littlest and the least. Number 13, there's another reason why missions, and that's because the Father is love. The Father is love. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. John 3, 16, God so loved the world. Romans 5, 8, God commendeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 2.4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. 1 John 3.16, hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And people say, well, if God... If God was loving, these bad things wouldn't happen. I'm going to say you, because God is love, he let a worse thing happen to his son to die on the cross for your sin. God is a loving God. And so why would God take a person, put them on the mission field? Why? Because God's love. God loves that person. You may think, well, he doesn't love that person like he loves me. Look at her. No, God loves that person as much, maybe more. God loves us all. God loves us all. So God is love. Number 14. The Father not only is love, but number 14, Christ is Lord. See, he's the boss, and he's the one that gave us the great commission. Matthew 23, 10, Jesus said, Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Christ was concerned about souls. You can't read the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether he's with a crowd, or with a, whether he's with a smaller group, or whether he's with an individual. Look, just That's a study in itself, just the individuals that Jesus worked with. God loves them. Why missions? Because God loves them because Christ is Lord. He's the one who gave us a great commission. The disciple is not above his 
master nor the servant above his Lord. It was he who gave us a great commission. It was he who sent the Holy Spirit to empower his church to fulfill the great commission. Number 15. A 15th reason is because the Spirit who is God, the Spirit gives light. The Spirit gives light. See, no conviction, no conversion. John 16, 7 and 8 Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient or necessary for you that I go, go away. For if I go not away, Jesus says, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So the Spirit of God is the one who regenerates people out there in the field. So God in the Holy Spirit sends men to take the Holy Spirit, to be used to the Holy Spirit, to preach through the power of the Holy Spirit... So people can be saved by the Holy Spirit. It's important for spirit-controlled missionaries to take a spirit-composed book into the world to have spirit-convicted men become spirit-converted men. Number 16. A reason why missions is because it's the gospel that gives liberty. A pure gospel is needed to free men from bondage and the burden of sin. We cited this early in John 8, 32. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Jesus said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. So Christ often liberated folks from the bondage and enslavement of demons, demons and sin. And so why missions? Because people are enslaved. People are in sin. I mean, the problems that I showed you up there, all the fractured families, dysfunctional homes, well, God cares about that. God cares about people. The people are enslaved in the sins of you know, fornication and homosexuality and things like this. God cares about them. So God says, I want you to go give them a life liberating message that can free them from that. That's why he calls men into missions. And lastly, I would say the reasons why we have missions is because heaven is lovely. Heaven is lovely. In John 14, 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Revelation 21, listen to these selected verses. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. Now get this, descending out of heaven. So if it descends out of heaven, then that means it's in heaven right now. So this is what heaven is like. Having the glory of God and her light was like a stone most precious even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And the building of the wall of it was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear crystal. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. And the city that had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Now heaven sounds like a good place to spend eternity. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So why missions? Why does he send a missionary? Why does he pick a chap up and he takes him from point A to point B? Why that? Because heaven is a lovely place and all these other places, you see, all these other reasons. So it's the glory of God to conceal a thing and it's also the glory of God to show us why. So that's why you do what you do. That's why we do what we do. Because there's a God out there that says, okay, Jerry, I want you to go here and there and I want Bible Baptist Church to, you know, help you get from here to there and to do what you need to do because I love people, I care about people, but God doesn't just love people out there, God loves people in here. And don't you ever be afraid of that, don't you ever doubt that, God loves you. If you're here this morning, you are a sinner, you are on your way to hell. If you know that and you realize that, God has made a way that that does not have to happen. He has taken your punishment, all the, law, all the sin, all the laws that you broke. For example, have you ever told a lie now, how many times have you told the lie? Add it up, count it up. You can't count, you lose track, right? Isn't that a wonderful thing that God in Jesus went to the cross and paid for all your sins, past, present, and future, thought, word, deed, did all of that? Now, the question is, and I remember Mike Custer saying this one time years ago, he said, if he used this illustration. He said, you know, if you want the Lord Jesus, you've got to be willing to lay down the sin. In other words, if you want to coddle your sin, you really don't want to be saved your sin. You want Jesus, you know. So, so I got my sin here and I got my Jesus here. No, that's not the idea. Because the Lord Jesus Christ comes in 
And he is the boss. He is the Lord. He wants to take your life. I tell people this. I say, accepting Christ as your Savior is like inviting somebody in and saying, make yourself at home. And so when you invite Christ in, you see yourself as a sinner, you know that he died for you, you know that he was resurrected three days later, and he lives for you, he intercedes, he wants you, he stands with open arms. When you invite him into your life, don't be surprised if he rearranges the furniture. Well, I just want him to save my soul from hell. No, no, no. The Jesus of the Bible is Jesus Christ our Lord. So don't get the wrong Jesus. Don't get the wrong idea about Jesus. He so if you are at that point, you say, well, you know, I don't know, dear friend, but it may be this morning that you say, I know, I know, I know I have sinned, and I understand that Christ died for me, and I want him as my... Would you bow the knee to him? Would you humble yourself before him? God gives grace to the humble, it says, and we're saved by grace. So you're like, oh, well, I don't... No, you're not ready to be saved if that's your attitude. But you can be saved this morning if you're not saved. And if you are saved, you know what? You go out those doors, that's a mission field out there. God has a business, not just in reaching people in Australia, but God has a business in reaching people here. And I trust and challenge you this morning to be the missionary that God wants you to be where you are. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you this morning that you show us you're not concealing it. There are many, many reasons why we're involved in missions. There's many, many reasons why there's faith promise in this church. There's many, many reasons why these flags are, are up. There's many, many reasons why we are here today. Many, many reasons why this church uh, supports and sends men like Brother Brower and, and uh, Brother Norberg. And Lord, we thank you that you care about souls. Now, may we care about souls. May we have a heartbeat for souls like you have. Lord, thank you for showing us the reason why and not concealing it. I think, Lord, sometimes you conceal things because you don't want us to know it because we wouldn't be ready to, to deal with it. But, Lord, when you clearly show us many times in many places many things about why missions, why we're supposed to evangelize, why we're supposed to reach out, I think we're pretty accountable for that. God, help us to do something about that. Help us to bow the knee. Help us to shed a tear. Help us to be burdened enough to talk to a neighbor or a family member or a colleague or someone we work next to. Oh, God, help us to have that burden. Help us to know that Jesus is coming soon. We need to be busy in the harvest field. Even if it's the 11th hour, you welcome 11th hour workers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Pastor.